Hey, what's going on, my little tattletales? So today we have two very special things going on. One, we have the lovely Layla, 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 <laughs> tells it all. Woo! Y'all, if you are new or old to YouTube, you know Layla Lynn. I've been watching her forever. I'm so proud and honored to have you on my channel. And Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank and you. we're doing the first annual book club. If you guys are watching on playback, this is going to be a great thing. Listen, we I know that you guys have done uh, the recaps. You guys have done reviews. Um, if you haven't actually seen, I believe it's on Grace and Layla's channel. You guys actually did. You, Grace, uh, Grace Report and Kempire uh, did a review of the whole book, which was hilarious. However, I wanted to go <laughs> a little bit deeper and do kind of like a book club because I kind of grew up on book clubs. So I thought yes. it'd be really fun. And since you are a housewife connoisseur, I thought it'd be amazing to have your input. So, you guys, my little tattletales. <laughs> I'm, I just want to say thank you for inviting me. I feel honored to be on your channel. So, thank you so much, Tisa, for inviting me. So I love your energy. I've been watching you for like, I want to say the past couple months, you started popping up on like my timeline, my YouTube oh, really? timeline. Yes, yes, you, you popped up out of here, girl. <laughs> I was like, who is this girl? <laughs> but I love your energy. So, thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Layla, she's such a, such a class act. So, <laughs> You guys, I hope whether you're a title tell or you're part of Layla's tribe, you have gotten your book. Now, listen, if you haven't gotten the book, I had to actually do it on Kindle because I'm traveling right now and I can't get it delivered. Um, go and get the book. As long as you don't have ketchup prints on your fingers, you can return it. And you know that Kindle gives you eight days to return books. So you can have a good time returning the book. Okay. Now. <laughs> Now, this will be good. Okay, so the first chapter we're going to get into is actually, I believe it's chapter eight, right? Chapter Ellie. eight. Yes. Now, chapter eight, you guys have to see to believe it is the real housewives of Potomac. They go in depth a lot of times. Now, you guys know I am a Candace sympathizer, right? <laughs> Do I think that Monique was out of her mind? Yes. Do I still think that Bravo did her dirty? Yeah, I think both things can be true. She was out of her mind, but the punishment was still too harsh, even though she was out of her mind, right? right. Um, so I would say that, you know, in the beginning, but we're going to actually get into it because they talk about a lot of things, right? The first part we're going to go through is the part of, it's called Chesapeake Babes, right? Yes, it's corny. Whoever wrote this, I don't even know where they got the title. <laughs> All I've diamond. never heard that. And I'm from that area. I've never heard that term, Chesapeake Babes. Yeah. I don't hate it. I just never, I've never heard that. But I'm with yeah. it. Listen, everything from even the title of this book, when I was trying to search for it, I'm like, what's it called? All oh, roses aren't rosé. It's just everything in there is so awkward. I was like, all right, I guess. I guess, right? <laughs> They can have done with Layla's. Layla, if you guys don't know, you watch her channel. She is a pro at the thumbnail and the short <laughs> title. They should have had Layla up there picking the titles. Like, no, that's not going to work. All time is a real day. What does that mean? Change it. Right. So right. You got to give something that people can latch on to. They understand what you're saying. Like, you got to give it to the people. And that title is not the best, but, you know, we'll look past that because we're well, readers. We're bookworm babes. We'll, we'll get into it anyway. Exactly. Okay. So now the first thing you guys need to know, a little preface of the Real Housewives of Potomac, right? Bravo at that time. So my sources in the Bravo camp are telling me that Bravo at that time was really excited about the success that the Real Housewives of Atlanta were having, right? And they wanted to get another um, uh, franchise of women that had a darker shade to their skin. At that time, Bravo, for some reason, they still had that thing where they think that if you have a culture, then it needs to be all this or all that, right? And they're very hesitant to kind of integrate things. But Bravo was actually looking at Houston. They wanted a Real Housewives of Houston. If you guys don't know, it would have been another Black Housewives show. And if you guys don't know, Houston with African and definitely Nigerian money, it's super, super deep. And it's super, super legit, right? But they were having problems getting very, very affluent. Because again, of course, I'm not Nigerian. But from what I've seen of my Nigerian friends and what people have confirmed to me, Nigerian culture is very conservative. 
you know, um, very yeah. conservative, very proud, very prideful. So it was very hard for them to find people that were going to actually come on uh, the reality TV show, you know? Yeah. They don't need, they have the money. And a lot of people, when they have money, they don't need fame. And I feel like I would be the same way. Like if I had yes. money, I would be the same. I don't need to be on reality TV. Yeah, so I get that, I get that. Yeah, I get that too. But that's what, so, but they started searching for Potomac. And they found Potomac first. And then Houston, because it was already a little difficult, fell by the wayside. So we're going into that. So we're talking about Sharice Jackson, right? Yeah. Um, she says right out the gate, she knew that casting for the show would be an uphill battle, right? Um, Adrian Walls, he's the Maryland, Virginia area, is, says that's the casting director, says it's not like New York, Los Angeles, or Atlanta. Now, you're from that area, Layla. Would you agree that it's not like New York or any of those other places? Oh, no. No, I would say it's totally different. Yeah. You have a lot of people with roots, like their family is from New York or different areas. But I would say, yeah, it's totally different. It's a different vibe than what you get in those cities. Like every one of these franchises have a different vibe. So it's definitely a totally different vibe. Yeah. Now, do you think that there's a Jack and Jill vibe in the Potomac, D.C. area? But you know what? I'm from outside of that area, but just from okay. where I am, it's definitely a Jack and Jill vibe. My per Personally, I've always been on the outskirts of that. Like I okay. have friends who have done Jack and Jill, but I've never actually done it myself. Um, um, Jack and Jill adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely, it's definitely that vibe. Yeah, definitely. Is it really? It's okay. So it's when, you say it's that, when you say it's that vibe then, do you see, do you, since you're adjacent, did you witness a lot of Sharice uh, Jordans and a lot of Karen Huger's? I would love to have. I would love to have. Um, growing up, I feel like maybe their their children or their nieces and nephews, maybe, you know, I was kind of around them to where their parents were really into their like one of my friends, like my best friend, her her family runs like a um what do you call it? a debutante? Yes. What do you call it? A debutante. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Her family runs like a debutante ball. So I've been, you know, involved with that culture. And none of them were as entertaining as either Sharice or Karen. That's why I say I okay. wish I would have. Because none of the okay. none of the moms were that entertaining. <laughs> but I would love to have been around either Karen or even Sharice. I, would I love that. I love that. Rim, thank you so much for the super chat. For you guys that don't know what Jack and Jill is, it is an elite society of people that strive for the best and people of color. They got a reputation, I don't know if it's deserved or not, that um, they had certain qualifications for you to be in there. You need to be a certain social economic bracket. You needed this, you needed that. So basically it's bougie, but it's certifiable bougie and it's legacy bougie. So that's what Jack and Jill is, right? And I also want to say this. I also want to say this because there are people who are not in a certain financial bracket who are also members. So oh, really? um, yeah, it's also about networking. Like even people who don't, who aren't in that bracket, if their parents network with people in that bracket. Oh, okay. I love that. So basically it's kind of like, you know how when you go to Harvard or Stanford at Yale, yes, some people, the majority of people might come from moneyed families, but some people come, but when you network, you get into those kind of yeah. pathways. Yeah. And what yes, you're like I didn't grow up in that bracket, but with my family, just, you know, my mom is like a, a just a friendly person and with her networking. Okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you guys, you just got an insight glimpse into Jack yeah, and Jill. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, here's the thing. It's not, as, it's not as exclusive as it sounds. It's yeah. not, was it, does it, has it become less exclusive or was it always kind of like had the reputation, but it wasn't as exclusive as it sounded? I think it's more, okay, this is going to sound crazy or a little bit, I don't know, whatever. It might sound like whatever, but some people might say it's about social class, but they might say it's about character. So you might not be in a certain class, but if you network and if you're of a certain character, then you, you know, then you're acceptable, I guess you would say, quote unquote. So it's much like Karen was saying, maybe like the way the Graham Dam says, we have etiquette, we have ways we carry yes. ourselves and yes. ways we do. And if you yes. can carry yourself properly in the t in the t in the room they welcome you at the table yes yes okay. yes, yes all right yes leave it to karen yes i agree with that Layla <laughs> is recruiting for jack and jill if anybody didn't know no, no. <laughs> just joking I'm just letting y'all know that everything you know when it comes to the black elite or whatever they call it everything is not as exclusive as you might think 
Okay. I mean, that's good to know. And I mean, at the end of the day, right? If people are trying to get people to present themselves a certain way, as long as everybody is eligible for it, I mean, you can't hate on that, right? You cannot, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, here's the thing, right? Sharice was saying that Adrian stressed that we weren't looking to duplicate the Rural Housewives of Atlanta. They wanted the Black version of the Rural Housewives of Beverly Hills. And to be quite honest, we don't flaunt our money like that. <laughs> Is that a common sentiment in the DMV area? Do people not flaunt their money? Because Sharice was showing us her wine room, her right. champagne room. So I was just like, Sharice, you know, Karen was giving us a tour through her mansion with her kitchen that hadn't been renovated since 1980. So I was just like, hmm, is this true? Do people not flaunt their wealth? I would say not on television. Like if you're having like a private conversation or, you know, inviting someone over to your house, that's different from flaunting it on television. I think television is the, you know, that's the main thing. Like okay. People from this area might not flaunt it on television. So is it like most moneyed areas? And I keep telling everybody, right? You know, you go anywhere and somebody's walking Hermes down or they got a Birkin or they got this and that. But when you get into deep money, they say they're quiet about it, but I'm like, that's your yacht parked on the deck. Like, that is your 300 foot yacht right there. What do you mean you're quiet about money? You know, they're wearing like little blue blazers and sneakers, but the blazers are handmade 18,000 and the, the mm. jeans are handmade from Japan. So is okay, it that type about of quiet money? money? <laughs> <laughs> is it that type of quiet money in Potomac? Like, that like again it they don't flaunt it they're not going to be hermes down and broken down but then you're like you got a mansion and you got this and you got that right i would okay. say yes because it's like you don't want to be tacky you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and it's a little bit tacky like flaunting your wealth is a little bit tacky is it not listen <laughs> yes <laughs> that does not mean i reserve the right to flaunt and be tacky one day you're gonna be like what did you want to talk with Layla? And I'm going to be like, shut up, shut up, get into this. Zoom in, zoom in. So, conversation. No, but you know what? It is. It is. It, to me, it doesn't strike as tacky. It just strikes me. And maybe that's the point of tacky. And we're saying the same thing. It, it strikes me as you ain't never had anything before in life. You know what it is? It's like the first time, like, we got Gucci bags, right? That bag went with every damn outfit, whether it was leggings, when I was going to the pool. But then once you get used to having things, it's like, yeah, you still appreciate it, but you're not trying to shove it in people's faces. It's just, yeah. it is what it is. So yeah. tacky, yeah, it just looks very, very Simon Gabodi-ish. You know, <laughs> very, very 60 years old, panning out to the private yeah. jet. You know, it's like, yeah. it's yeah. your first private flight. Yeah. We get it, okay. <laughs> so, listen. So Ritz actually says, right, she says that, the, so Adrian, the producer, says, he was casting, said the area is very conservative. The women, they're not at all showy about their wealth. They don't throw in a pair of Louis Vuittons to gra and grab their Birkins to run the grocery store. This feeds into what you're saying, Layla, right? Now, she right. says she wasn't interested in doing the show at first because her husband wasn't at all supportive. But she used to be the president of the NBA Wives Association, so she has a lot of connections. And she figured she'd help them with casting. One of her first calls was to Giselle. Because she said, I knew Giselle would do it. Right. Now, <laughs> you want to talk about tacky? <laughs> she knew Giselle. <laughs> First thought was Giselle. Giselle, you want to talk about tacky and who's going to show off their wealth? Giselle Bryant. Yes. Yes. You know, I hate to call people tacky, okay. but Giselle's house and the way she flaunts her wealth. And even the little Gucci Mini Cooper, I know that was Jamal's when he left, but I still would have left that in the driveway for Grace. You know, <laughs> I would have left that in. It's yes, it's little. It's perfect for Grace and the other girls. They can share, you know, yeah, it's perfect for her daughter. Yes. And no yeah. shade. If you don't have a car, fine, drive any car. I and mean, listen, if somebody gave me the car, I'd be like, hey, thank you. I'm not really into names when it comes to cars and stuff. Right. But the fact that she was in it popping, it's kind of like, listen, I don't judge anyone. But if you're sitting here in my face saying, and you better be impressed, I'm like, okay, well, impressed. And your little Gucci car. <laughs> and the little thing and the Gucci thing, pulling the seatbelt over, <laughs> trying to let everybody know it's Gucci. And I was like, okay, yeah. right? All right, Giselle. Dying. The Gucci seatbelt. I am yeah. dying. <laughs> We just kept it in the camera. I was like, we get it. That's a Gucci Fiat. We get it. 
<laughs> oh wait, before we go, I want to give a shout out to Diane and Pretty Brown Eyes for joining the Tattletale family. Welcome, 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 you guys. What's up to Mel, NYC Reviews? Mel, he co-hosts um, Recaps with me sometimes. He's a big fan of yours, so he was excited about uh, you being here. Now- Yes, I love Romel. Yes, thank you. Yes. Oh, and he's a new YouTuber. He's a new YouTuber, Romel Price. Make oh, sure you check him out. Definitely Romel Price. Make sure you check him out. But it's at Mel NYC Reviews. Mel oh, okay, okay, NYC Reviews. Okay, he's bad. also new to YouTube, but he's just getting his channel together. So you, you know, okay. yeah, okay. prepare to support him from the start. Him. Yeah, support yes. him from the start. Yes, yeah, supporting from the start. Now, okay, so. Uh, now, okay, so we all know why she said that. We all cackle said Giselle's khaki. Then Giselle goes on to say, I'm an independent woman. So I didn't really consult too many people about Green to do the show. Giselle has a level of hubris that is would only be enjoyable on TV. Yeah, on TV, <laughs> I love it. To be her friend, it's just like, Giselle, girl, stop, right? She said, but I did have a conversation with my girls where I explained to them, Doing a show like this is going to open me up to all kinds of criticism. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to love me and also a lot of people who are going to hate me. They're going to say bad things about your mom. And they were like, mom, we know who you are. We love you no matter what. And that made me feel confident moving forward. I actually believe that because Giselle does use her daughters as her counsel. I said from the last review, I feel like they need family therapy because she exposes her daughters to certain grown things, but then other things where I'm like, tell the rest of the story, she doesn't. But I do believe that she went and talked to her daughters about joining the show. What did you think about Giselle and what she's saying about joining the show and consulting with her daughters? I'm glad to hear she consulted with her daughters. At one point, even though her daughters were on the show, I was kind of like concerned about them. Like, do mm -hmm. they really want to be here? Like, I couldn't really tell. Yeah. If you notice their vibe, you know, in the in the early seasons, it was like, okay, do they really want to film? But then like when Grace started doing confessionals with her, I was like, okay, they do want to film. And so I'm glad to see them filming. And I feel like they can be influencers, just like Cynthia's daughter. Yes. So like, I'm excited for them. Like, I really like them. Like, I'm fans of Giselle's daughters. And isn't so it so I, I love the odd? Show. I've never seen it. I've seen it with sons, but not so much daughters. All three of Giselle's daughters look just like her, but they yeah. all have different versions of her face, but it's the same <laughs> damn face. It's just three expressions. Grace is her twin, <laughs> and the other two daughters are just, yeah, they can be influencers. They are smart. They are yeah, they definitely could be. They definitely could be influencers. Now, when it came to how Karen came on, right? We're going to go through Karen um, and Katie. Karen said, I always thought that if Bravo ever came to Potomac beating the grass looking for housewives, my name would come to the top. I was very confident about that. Robin says, the way I remember it, both Giselle and Cherise contacted me at the same time. They were like, Bravo's doing a show. We think you should talk. And Katie said, um, Katie said that she didn't know any of them. But Sharice knew that I was a hot ass mess and I lived in Potomac. And that's why they called me. You got to love Katie's odyssey. She yeah. like <laughs> I do love Katie. I do. I really love Katie. I miss her on the show. Um, she shouted me out one time on Twitter. Oh, so I didn't have to acknowledge that. Yeah, she called me an, an investigative reporter. <laughs> I love that. You are. You are. Claim it. Claim it. Claim it. You too, girl. But I was like, she sees the vision. So I love me some Katie. And um, I, I do I do agree with what she was saying. Like, she's a hot mess. And Sharice noticed. And she wanted her on the show. Sharice was in charge of the girls. Like, she pretty much casted the show just like Nene casted Real Housewives of Atlanta. Yes. Which, come to think of it, right? Let's get down to this really good part, right? They talk about... Um, they talk about the way that Sharice was forced off the show. It's interesting to me to hear about Bravo's internal metrics because I actually mm -hmm. like Sharice. I thought she was the nexus, right? She yeah. brought everyone together. And I like, uh, to me, she screamed wealth. She screamed connections. And she goes on to say that she wanted to stay on. but And Andy Cohen says that Bravo said that the numbers weren't adding up, that she wasn't connecting with viewers. So they literally did the same thing they did to Mariah Huck and push her out of her whole show. Now, I do have a few Bravo insiders that say that's not actually the whole story. Bravo, even if you bring them a show, doesn't like cast members that are also producers because they don't like cast members to really have that much power. So even though they might bring you in and they're clapping hands, they'll push you out. What do you think? But was was Cherise, one question, I have two thoughts, but one question, Cherise wasn't a producer, was she? She wasn't a producer, but she had bought the show. So I believe she had some type of executive producing credit. She bought the show? 
Yeah, she was the one that actually they she helped do casting and she kept ca and she helped cast the show. So she had some type of influence in the show, and I believe she did have some type of production credit. It might not have been a big one, but she had some sort of production credit. Okay, I was not aware of that. I was not well, aware of that. Also, what Bravo is saying is that. Even if you don't have an official production ca uh, credit, they still don't like you having too much control over the show or even when people look at you kind of as a nexus. What show am I thinking about that had that? Not Mariah, because Mariah actually had the producing credit. But right. right. When even Nene, Nene was yes. unofficially, you know, she cast it Real Housewives of Atlanta. So I definitely get what you're saying. And I do I do agree with that. I just feel like, okay, and, and Sharice mentioned this in the book, how basically her storyline and her divorce wasn't going fast enough. Like she was mm -hmm. going through a real divorce, which takes time. Like in real life, it could pay, it could take years to get divorced. And so they felt like her storyline was going too slow. And then she also kind of, it seemed like she was limited in what she could say. And looking back at the show, I do feel like Sharice was kind of like on guard the entire time she was on the show. She, you could tell she was limited. And with, you know, reality show audiences, I feel like when you can tell a person is limited in what they say, I do mm -hmm. feel like people connect less with them. People connect more with people who just say whatever, and they connect less with people who mm -hmm. are dark. That's my personal opinion. I agree with you. And excuse me, I'm looking down for, are you guys thinking, I'm listening to what Layla's saying, but I'm scrolling through my little audio. Yeah, we both got the book. book. <laughs> she made a really good point. But if you, if you guys read this chapter, she, and it's so funny you said that about being guarded. She said that Bravo was saying, um, you know, people feel like you're guarded. And she was saying, but you guys are the one limiting me. Sharice wanted to show more of her life. She just yes. got the divorce. She even said, I wanted to show them that um, I just found out that my kids had siblings we didn't know about. And I wanted to show that them meeting on camera for yes. the first time. Yes. I would have loved to see that. Yeah, yes. I would have been see. Yes. I would have been like, so go on. What happened, right? Yes, tell me, girl. Right? So your yes. birthday is September and yours is October, <laughs> the same year. <laughs> oh, right? Really? And they, But they refused to show any of that. They only wanted to put Sharice in a box where your storyline is your divorce. And maybe that's because it was Bravo's short-sightedness. Because at that time, they were really hung up on being a housewife. They didn't even, I think, have that many divorced housewives, did they, at that time? Right. This is years ago. This was years yeah. ago. And then also when it comes to her husband, her husband refused to film. And we'll see mm -hmm. as we go through this book, when somebody's husband refused to film, it influences their position on the show. Like someone can't be a star of Real Housewives of whatever franchise. They can't become a legend on the show when their husband refuses to film. It really limits them. And Sharice's husband refused to film. This is true. Sharice does bring this up in the book, too. But here's my question to you. Why do they have that dumb rule, that rule? Because every single time it seems with the family and husband, it is dry. It is slow. <laughs> the only time I've ever seen anything that was good on, I think it was Meredith on Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. And she had on the first season, she had dinner with her husband and her husband sat down and was like, give me your phone. And she was like, what? And he was like, let me see your phone. He had her own blast by the cameras with there. And you can see Meredith's face. Like, I am never going to do this again. Yeah. And I loved it. I loved it. Yes. I feel like, okay. So Andy has said that housewives is actually kind of like tongue in cheek. Like you don't really have to be a housewife to be on the show. And he says that it's like a new, like a, a new version of a housewife where you, you don't even actually have to be married. But at the same time, if you look at how they produce the show, it is a little bit traditional. They do want to see your okay. husband. They do want commentary from your husband. Um, and that's just how they're that's just how they're doing it. I do see that's how they're doing it, even though they say they're doing it differently. You know what? You bring up a good point. I've noticed on the franchise that are the mm -hmm. husbands actually have a yes, they actually have a guest role. You're right. Not so much in OC and Beverly Hills, but definitely in Roja and definitely Potomac, they give them starring roles. Okay, okay, I see what you mean. Yes, 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 yes. You were right. I was thinking you meant this, but you're right. Yeah. You, you meant that. Yeah, those particular shows, they do, yes, they do give the husbands more, more screen time. Like people like Peter, they get more screen time. You're right. But Greg, right. Peter, Apollo, we knew all of them, even Todd, and you get into Potomac. And the weird part is the husbands don't get paid. For anybody who don't know, the husbands don't get paid. <laughs> So they literally are getting two for the price of one. But I guess, like right. you said, if that's the rules of work in there, what are you going to do? Now, 
they talk about when Ashley was met. There's a level of cluelessness to these producers, but let's just take them for a role. They said Ashley was unlike anything they'd ever met. Ashley wasn't seeking fame. She didn't care. She just wanted to show up and have fun. And I said, can you guys be that stupid? Who shows up for reality TV not seeking fame? Just like, oh, what's this? This might be fun. Of course she was looking for fame. But That's she her game. Like, That's yeah. her game. She got them. She got them. And I'm not mad at Ashley. I'm not mad I'm at Ashley. I'm not either. Not yeah. <laughs> Ashley did a Gemini <laughs> hustle. What? Yes. Please. What is that? I would never. I'm just here because I love working with you guys, right? She made her eyes. No, Robin said, right? When Robin said she wanted to be side, she said, you have to understand on one of the first call call, of calls I had with production, I remember being asked, is there anything off the table, right? They asked, is there anything off the table? And I said, when it comes to Juan, his personal business and his financial issues, they're not on the table. He doesn't want to talk about that. Then Katie said, so then Ashley jumps in. These are all, so just to let you guys know in the book, the interviews are all separate, but they combine them together, right? Ashley said, you really can't do that. Katie said, Ashley and I filmed at a park so she could meet my kids. But before she came over, Ashley was talking to producers for probably 30, 40 minutes. We were there for a long time. Katie goes on to say, while we were on the swing set, Ashley bought up Robin's finances, claiming she had Googled them. Ashley... I tried to convey it in a more caring way. Like, oh, I didn't know this about Robin. But in hindsight, no matter how I said it, it was going to look like I was being shady. Then Katie said, Ashley was like, um, why is this Silver Spring Baltimore ghetto ass girl trying to pretend like she has anything? Her comments were really nasty, right? So mm. then Giselle said, later that night, Katie, Robin, and I were sitting in a car together waiting to get mic'd up to film at Sharice's house. There weren't cameras on us or anything, and out of nowhere, Katie turns and tells Robin, oh, by the way, Ashley spilled all your business. Robin said she was livid. She went berserk. Eric, the producer, came out the car to get us mic'd up and flipped. And flipped. Now, here's the thing that lets you get a, a, a nuance into Giselle and Robin's friendship. This was, in, and let me know what you think about it. Okay. But, a lot of people say that Giselle is only out for Giselle and she seems okay. to be really good friends with Robin and she's known Robin, right? So um, Katie says, Robin went crazy. I wish they had the camera on her because this girl got out of the car, went over to Eric and flipped out on him. She was pointing her finger. She was like, I told you not to F with me like this and not talk about my shit. I trusted you and you guys are MF and liars. Robin said, after that happened, I knew in my life, Ashley didn't do this on her own. It was to be a producer, right? Yeah. Katie said she she left and she refused to film that night. Giselle said, I looked at Katie afterwards and said, oh, and Katie said to Giselle, oh, no, was it something I said? And Giselle was like, I'm going to wring your neck, Katie, because whatever you said sent Robin to a place that we never want to see again. Robin is so sweet. But when you set her off, it's over, right? Giselle goes through plenty of times in the book bragging about how she produces scenes, bragging yes, about how she yes. brings drama. You guys are right. She is a pot store and she delights in it. She takes pride. But the fact that even it seemed like she was mad at Katie, that Katie had given Robin the tip off that Ashley was about to play her. And I said, I know Robin and Giselle are good friends, but this brings me back to what everybody said about Giselle is only Giselle's friend. What did you think about that? I do think Giselle is only about Giselle. So when I read in the book that Giselle thinks she's producing the show, like it just confirmed to me, like I already knew that Giselle thinks she's producing the show. That's why she brings up things about Wendy's husband. Like that's why she brings up a lot of the issues that she brings up because she, she low key calls herself a producer. So I wasn't surprised about that. I also wasn't surprised when it was like Ashley in the book. It said Ashley was actually talking to producers for like 20, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Or she did that scene with Katie on the swings and she talked about Robin's finances with Katie. I wasn't surprised to hear that because all of this stuff is produced. Like it comes from somewhere. So mm -hmm. I wasn't surprised to hear that. I also wasn't surprised to hear that Robin was aggressive about it. Okay. Why is that? Because she's from Silver Spring, Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Robin is aggressive like she hasn't physically fought on the show but she's been aggressive she's been in Monique's face she's been in Ashley's face she's an aggressive woman and we can't deny that so I'm never surprised to hear somebody tells me that Robin was aggressive and in somebody's face it's like yeah I believe it because I've seen it on the show I believe it and I'm not surprised okay you know here's the thing I've never seen Robin aggressive in my opinion without her being provoked that said it did 
flip up. But Robin always looks like she always dresses like she's ready to fight, if that makes any sense. She, you know how sometimes <laughs> you're like, I look too cute to be getting in a fight. Robin always looks Not like Robin. she needs to go. Right? I'm ready. She go. Look, look, she like got her she, little jumper on. She got her overalls on. She ready for it. She's in the mirror practicing, like, yes. you know, the give. Like, let me, ooh, ooh, okay, let's go, let's go. She's making sure she can move. Robin always yes. looks like she's doing that to me, right? Yes. Now, right? They talk about Katie leaving, and it said Kate, Katie also became very difficult to film with in season two. She did her Casino Royale charity event, and I remember hearing that her mother was cussing everybody out the entire yeah. time, screaming her head off at producers. At some point, you just realized it wasn't worth the trouble. That's funny that they say that about Katie's mom, because I know what Katie's Instagram lives. I'm a fan of Katie. Don't know her personally. It's a parasocial relationship. Right. But she always seems like there's deep childhood issues. And it's always some beef she's going through with her mom. And to hear that her mom mm -hmm. was in the casino. I'm Again, I don't know why she was cursing. She might have had a reason. But usually people that have those type of issues, there's something in the house. You know what I'm saying? I, yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah it got to be. It got to be. Yeah. So then they actually roll into Monique, right? Um, <laughs> shout out to Monique. Look, Monique yeah, is probably watching Monique. right now. <laughs> listen, <laughs> I listen. Binder Times gave me <laughs> at least thirty minutes of uninterrupted yes. laughter where I couldn't breathe. So shout out to Monique. Yeah, right? I, hate, I hated Binder Times. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, you know how you know comparing Roa to RHOP. You know how Fallon is doing. She's giving you family vlogs, very edited, yes. very slick. I always say, thought Monique should have done that instead that of. That would have been so smart. Yeah. That would have yeah. been, but I think, from my opinion of Monique, Monique is very prideful. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a prideful person too. That's why I can recognize it, right? Mm -hmm. Monique's very prideful. I say that with respect, right? We can all be prideful. Um, Monique was so mad at the way she, I don't even, she obviously from this book, you guys, I eat my words. Monique did not get fired. They wanted to bring her back. Monique was telling the truth when she said she quit. We're getting to that in a second. But Monique was telling the truth and they confirmed it that they wanted her back. I apologize, Monique. I thought she got fired. But um, <laughs> yes, that, I really did. Them. I swear, <laughs> I, think, I think Chris made her quit the show, right? I think Chris made her quit the show. And the fact that Chris is like, this is messing with my family. I don't want this, all this stuff. It's And again, this is just my opinion on what I've seen of Chris. You know, he's very image conscious. They, For whatever reason, whether she was right or wrong, we can all agree that she got out of character when she attacked Candace, right? Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like, I could see him being like, this isn't the right move. We got businesses. We got this. We're well-respected. Just leave while you're ahead. And like yeah. Monique said, which kind of pissed Andy off, at least in my opinion, Monique actually didn't need that check. If this one thing we can say about Monique and Chris, they are sitting on a nice coin and they met and she manages his funds very, very well. Right. So listen, the whole thing about Giselle Bryan, right. Um, Giselle, so Monique, so Monique says, listen, um, she said, I watched the whole show and I thought I'd get along with everyone, including Giselle. She seemed like a fun, cool chick. Every time you start staying, hearing Monique use the word chick, She's being disingenuous. I've listened mm. to Monique enough to know her tells. Whenever mm. she describes you as a chick, she's being like fake Monique, right? Mm. Okay, come on, analysis. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't think I was going to have issues. But if you look back, the only person I didn't meet at Katie's event was Giselle. And that's because they purposely kept us apart. They knew there would be a conflict, maybe. Giselle said, it was 10 seconds when we met. Everyone has run with that until the towels come home. Like, oh my God, Giselle hates Monique. Today, Giselle said, yes, I do hate Monique, but I didn't hate her back then. <laughs> so then Cherie said, so then um, Cherie said, why do you, they asked her, why do you think there's beef? And she said, that's because Monique, for whatever reason, she thinks everyone is jealous of her or wants something from her. It's like, no, honey, nobody wants that life of yours. Now, if you remember, it was rumored that Cherise was accosted by a man in Safeway down in the DMV area. Yeah, and it was also leaked that that man who accosted her was um, Chris Sammy, Monique. Yeah. Said. He didn't put his hands on her, but he got into a verbal argument and dragged her and read her. But that's, I think, when Chris saw it, everybody was trying to say that baby wasn't his, right? Now, yeah. Giselle was to say, 
I felt sorry for her, to be honest with you, because she was really trying so hard. It's like anybody who tries that hard, maybe they shouldn't really be there. Giselle is a mean girl to her heart. It made me feel bad for Monique when it's like I was very hard on Monique after she accosted Candace. I used to like Monique. But it made me feel a little bit bad for her. Like you literally had a bunch of mean girls going at you. But unlike Wendy, who does not give a damn, right? <laughs> Monique really wanted to be accepted by them. And that's what made me just feel like, oh, you poor baby. You know, what do you think about that? I don't have a lot of empathy for Monique. I don't hate Monique, but at the same time, I don't have a lot of empathy for her. Um, also, do you have Safeway where you live? Um, no, but I used to live in an area that had Safeway. Okay, so you know yeah. it's very ghetto, for lack of a better word. <laughs> Safeway is very ghetto, and I don't see Sharice shopping at Safeway. So when I heard that rumor that Sharice was at Safeway and Chris Samuels accosted her, I don't see Sharice or Chris Samuels at Safeway. You know so I don't know about the validity. Of, you, you think on an off day they might go to Safeway? Yes, because... <laughs> yes. Because we've all been at, not Safeway, but we've all been, whether you're in the Northeast at the bodega or the little uh, store in downtown LA or in Safeway, when you just need some salt and damn butter and you look in there and you're like, is everything in this store rotten? The lettuce is dying, wilted, the tomatoes are shriveled. You know, there's a cat or worse, a dog barking somewhere. And you're just like- yeah, and you're just like, I just need to get some damn salt. You're like, or some baking soda. It's just something you're like, let me just go in, run and get this instead of going all the way to the store. So I oh. I, think that I believe that she, met, but then again, that said, there were so many rumors going around. I will say Crazy Days and Nights also reported this. And Crazy Days and Nights has always been super, it's kind of like Love B. Scott. I'm not saying yeah. he's always right. But 90% of the time. Yeah. yeah. But I'm going to B. Scott be on it. Yeah. I, I, be on I, it. Yeah. And it happens exactly the way he says. So it's like, is anyone 100% right? No. But 98% of the time, his stuff pans out. And the other 2%, we just never hear about it again. So we don't know if he was right or wrong. Right. right. Now, um, they talk about, uh, so Sharice and uh, Giselle talk about why they fell out. Right. Giselle's delusional. Right. Char Giselle's like, Listen, Sharice came, and I see Giselle's weak fault too. Giselle heaps it on as long as you say you can take it. But the minute you humble yourself to her and you're like, listen, I can't do this anymore. Her soft spot opens up because she said that Sharice goes on to say, listen, my marriage was in trouble long before Giselle started doing this and that, right? She said, I, to your point, Layla, she said, I knew, uh, this is Sharice talking about her husband, Eddie. I knew he'd be that way. And honestly, when I first called him and told him they asked me to do the show, I hope he begged me not to do it so that we could focus on our relationship because our marriage was not in a good place. Instead, he said, well, if you don't do it, we'll probably get a divorce. No, I'm sorry. Well, if you do it, we'll probably get a divorce. That Sharice, I feel for her because there's nothing, I mean, Hopefully you've never been in a situation. There's nothing like being in a crumbling relationship that you hope to salvage, but there's no help. That's some dark yeah. days put on like the saddest song you can and press repeat for 40 times before <laughs> right. it rips the plug out the wall, you know? Right. You listening to Sade looking at the wall. Like, yeah, I felt bad for her too. Because it was no reconciling. And no. I, I read the book, I realized that it was no reconciling. And I heard that he had already moved on. Like, remember Sharice was saying he doesn't actually live with her. I think he was in New Jersey. I heard it was actually in New Jersey with another woman. He had already moved on. Yes. And sadly, there was no reconciling him. When I read this, to your point, I heard, I'm crying in everyone's tears. Right. Literally, I just heard the Queen of Songs was on day like, ah. So Giselle said, Charissa and I have gotten to a wonderful place now because we're, she's able to look back and realize I was never really trying to hurt her. Cut to Charisse. The only reason I moved past it is because with Giselle is because the production team and the network is that's all told me you need to make up with her. You need to let it go. Giselle then said, I was just calling Sharice out on her stuff. That's the show. Had she said to me, Giselle, chill out. I'm going through a divorce. This isn't helping. There's a whole lot I would not have said. Do you believe that? Because part of me wanted to believe it, but it just popped into my head right now. Wasn't she the same person when both of Karen's parents were suffering from Alzheimer's and dying and Ray was with the thing for tax fraud, tax evasion or whatever it was, the tax bill? She was the same one digging in, teasing her about Ray leaving and all this stuff. So do you believe that if Sharice had humbled herself and come to her, that she would have chilled? 
maybe for one episode, like she would have chilled a little bit. Cause I do feel like um, Giselle does have this big sister, you know, bow mm -hmm. to me type of thing to her. So she might've chilled for like a minute or two, but then she would have went back to herself. And herself I, is empty. Yeah. You know what? To your point, the only person she takes it easy on, I've said this a million times is Ashley. And that's because oddly enough, she sees herself in Ashley, yeah. a woman with not that much power, the only thing she has is her beauty and her brains married to a much powerful man that randomly cheats on her and disrespects her and embarrasses her. The sad and funny thing about that is so she looks at Ashley like, it's okay. Embarrassed. You're talking about Giselle, but why am I getting embarrassed? Like, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you're right. You're right. But when she was with them all, those were some dark yes. times. Like, right. I'm not even shading her because if anyone's ever been cheated on or embarrassed, it's not funny. And, there's, and this isn't to take away from who Giselle is as a woman. If a man cheats on you or whoever your partner cheats on you, that has nothing to do with you. That's them. But she always looked at Ashley, like, come here, little sis, I got you. And yeah. Ashley's always looking at her crazy, like, we are not the same. Ashley <laughs> feels like she has nothing in common with Giselle and always looks at Giselle crazy, like, why do you think that we have something in common? <laughs> it's funny to see Giselle take Ashley under her wing and Ashley's like, get away. We don't have nothing in common. But I feel like she actually uses her. She uses Giselle to her advantage a little bit. But yeah, I do I do see what you're saying. Like Ashley is not really falling for Giselle. Like you know what? I agree. Ashley is very, very strategic and she's realized. Yes. She's realized and because she never comes for Giselle and she'll come for anybody else. So you're right. Ashley yeah. is being strategic, right? Um yeah. so then they talk about when Candace comes. Oh, first they talk about when Ashley and Giselle and Robin got in it at the kangaroo restaurant, right? <laughs> at Robin, what made her see red was when I first saw Ashley at the restaurant, she gave us that, hey guys, greeting all right, happy right, right, right. And I just pissed me, she said, that just pissed me off even more. And I was like, this B-I-T-C-H, right? So then Giselle, so then um, Ashley said, I won't lie. I wasn't happy. I hate when Ashley speaks in her pageant voice, right? I won't lie. I wasn't happy because this was my business, you know? It's a dining environment. Ask me to come outside or go to the back or something. I agree. That was Ashley being diplomatic because I would have been mad if somebody had rolled up in my place of business, whatever. Now right. here is Giselle too, me wondering, Giselle, do you see friendship or is it all about production? She said, that's, Giselle said, that scene was everything. We rolled in, Robin explained to Ashley how she felt and we were out that door. It was epic. I freaking loved that scene. She looks at everything, even very heartbreaking things that happened to her bestie yes. as a moment. You know, right. it was terrible. That was a terrible, it was a moment, but it was a terrible moment. Like you see your best friend in somebody's face. That's not okay. It's not okay. That was a terrible moment in the Real Housewives of Potomac. But of course, Giselle, the low key producer, thinks it was great. She thinks it was a moment. She thinks she produced it. And that's, that's a shame. If you ask me, that's a shame. That's it a was shame. a shame because you think about it. If you're supposed to be my friend, we can do that to other people together and laugh about it. But come on, let's have some unity, right? So then, right. So then they talk about Candace. Now, this is interesting about Candace, y'all. It says, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I swear, I got the show because I prayed for it. Candace is so religious. Okay, right? And she said, when the show first started airing, I remember watching and being like, why the F am I not on this? What, where was I when they were casting? Because I grew up watching Roja and I was so excited to see another all black housewives ensemble. But as entertaining as the show was, it was also a bit dull and I knew I could spice it up and show another facet of black womanhood. I have this couch at the foot of my bed where I pray. <laughs> um, all over I pray and I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, why you laugh, Pizza? Why you why you take a minute and laugh to yourself? Because <laughs> I got the visual in my head of her. She's like, there's a foot at the, like she's trying to tell us that she has a bitch at the foot of the bed as an altar. Girl, when you pray, at least I don't know, when people pray to God, I've always seen people get in where they fit in, like as long as they can get their sometimes if they can't even move their hands, their eyes are closed, like please God, please God, don't let me mess this up. So but here's the thing she said, it just it's this book that they made us read in um grade school talking about are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, or something like that. Um oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's what it reminded me of because she said she put her hands together and got down on her knees and said, Lord, if this is something that is an opportunity for me to help accomplish my goals and make my dreams a reality, can you make this happen? I'm sure Candace felt that, but every time people, but then again, do you think that's it's real? It To me, 
it was a little Pollyanna, but maybe that's because I only pray whenever shit's going down. I, you know, that's what God is about. Like. <laughs> you know, I, mean, like, I, I pray all the time. I am a Christian okay. person. I pray a lot. Um, the way my bedroom is set up, I don't have room for a bench at the end okay. of my bed. But if I did, I would. That seems like a okay. perfect place to pray. So I, I was not hating. I feel like people take a look at Candace's character on the show. And then when they hear her say she prays, it's, it's humorous to them. But I think she's genuine. Well, I, I don't think. I'm a big Candace fan. I believe she has a close relationship with God. I believe she prays. But for me, again, maybe I'm the heathen that only prays when things are going down. When like the house is burning down, I'm like, please, I, listen. Please help me, Lord. <laughs> it's me. No, Gabriel, do not put me on hold. I need to sit down now. So it's me praying when things are going down. So to hear that people pray for good stuff, maybe I should start doing that, right? Because he hears my call when things are crumbling. So maybe I should be like, yeah. um, Everything's fine, but I have I have a few I have a few things right, and the talk. Oh, so you, should. Sure. you definitely should, yeah, yeah. So you know, no, but I'm not laughing at her close relationship with God. Like I talk a lot of trash, but I am spiritual too, and in my head. But you'll never see me on my hands and knees because you know my whole family might clown me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing, right? Noah, he's a producer, said that they had real expectations that Candace and Ashley would be friends, right? Um, Karen said, I loved Candace when we first met. <sighs> Did you love her when you tried to get her fired through HR? She said she was fun, bubbly, energetic, articulate, and bright. Immediately we, we bonded. Then here comes Monique. Monique still, I don't understand. How did you start the fight, win the fight, publicly humiliate this girl, run around on every platform and gaslight the world and submit her to a hate campaign I have never, I don't even think Monique thought that things were going to blow up, but she became a lightning rod for hate. Candace was bullied viciously on social media for a year. And I've never seen anything like that. You would think Monique would be like, I won, I won. But here comes Monique. Nobody liked Candace when that show first started. They all thought she was immature and a little girl. They tried to ice her out the same way they did me my first season because she's just immature. And I said, girl, what? Do you need to see Candace under the ground? When are you going to let this go? I don't know. But like on that same page, you see Karen saying, I love Candace. You know what I mean? So it's such a juxtaposition when you hear one person say, I love Candace. And then you hear another person saying, oh, nobody like Candace. You know what I mean? It shows it shows my Monique's biases. And I understand she has yes. those biases because she got in a physical altercation with Candace, not just physical, but also verbal. And, you know, a lot of times verbal, that's a deeper issue, right? The mm -hmm. things that people say about you verbally. So I understand Monique's point of view, but at the same time, I won't say that when Candace came on the show, you can't say that people hated her when she first came on the show. That was not you, the case. Do you know what's so funny? I don't say think that people hated her, but I did because I was on Twitter back then, right? Twitter just got mm -hmm. too toxic for me. I had to like take a break. But <laughs> I did notice it was weird that everything she did was hated. And I was like, I Candace? don't see... And, and Candace talks about this. She said that... Um, she said, I learned early on when you're on the show, everybody is given a box, whether they want it or not. You're kind of forced into the space and you have to exist there. There can sometimes be wiggle room. Like if the story makes sense, they'll allow you to shift into a different box, but it's where you're allowed to just be a real person. For me, the box was I was a spoiled, rotten princess. Everything is centered around me being a brat. Meanwhile, I'm literally the only housewife on the cast uh, who had all my businesses before I was on the show. All right, Candace, you did. You did. You did that. Um, now, she said um, she said that she thinks the reason why. She talks about Cherise saying that, to your point, it didn't work out because Eddie didn't feel right. Um, there's something. That, oh, what was I wanting to say, right? Um they talk about Ray um, and his tax troubles, right? And yeah. you know, Karen does her grand on deflections where um, <laughs> Giselle said, Karen was trying to keep her financial issues off camera. Her life was falling apart and we were all supposed to act like it's not happening. No, we're going to talk about it. Karen likes to live her life in a fantasy she created, but I chose not to live on Fantasy Island. I live in reality. Karen says... Everything you've ever witnessed between Ray and me on this platform was trying us, but all marriages have challenges and we've always taken our challenges at one. We fight for our marriage and that's why we're winning. I love the way, no matter what Karen says, she never actually addresses the question ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we're winning. Karen. I love it. I, 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 
I, I, I look up to that. I wouldn't mean I wouldn't mind being that type of woman when I grow up. Like something yes. about that, I admire. Like you yeah. answer every question with a positive spin, girl. I love it. I love it. I love it. I yes. Love it. No, here's some real juice, right? They talk about Ashley and Monique's argument about her being drunk and getting in a car accident, right? Yeah. Monique goes on to say, right? This is in season three. When the accident happened, we all been filming a scene, me, Ashley, and Candace, when Finley wrapped, Ashley and I went to have a drink. I'm a very slow drinker. But over the course of our time there, I ordered three drinks, including a Moscow melon, which I sent back for a martini because I didn't like it, right? Candace jumps in. You know, she can't wait. I have to leave to film more, but they, uh, but they were done for the day. So they said, we're going to the bar and have a drink. And I wasn't there. I didn't see it. But I've witnessed Monique driving after she's been drinking in the past. Monique says, I would never get behind the wheel if I was intoxicated. I didn't even feel drunk, which is what every drunk person said. Exactly. Right. <laughs> You're just like, girl, you've had eight I'm great. I got it. <laughs> right? She said, I have been up since four that morning. I just moved into a new house. I didn't have a nanny for the kids. I was managing all the financials of the rental properties, plus starting my business. She had her spill worked out, plus working on a board of a charity, all while filming this reality show. And I just had a miscarriage weeks earlier. I was exhausted and I was driving. The day just hit me and I felt myself start to doze off. I tried to roll down the windows to turn the music up again to keep myself up, but it happened again and I opened my eyes. I was headed straight to a tree. Luckily, I swerved and wound up in a ditch, but the car still had something like $40,000 in damages and I got whiplash and a mild concussion. I should not laugh. I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because she's writing ABC after school specials. That's why you're <laughs> laughing, Layla. Let me tell y'all something. Why I think that this is all BS and this is a made up story. Monique's story has not changed since the first time she gave the excuse. And by not changed, I mean she has said it verbatim, word for word. And there is no one when you're telling the truth that even the words stay the same, even the order. You have a script in your mind and you keep reciting it. Girl, Monique. Not a script. Not a script, Tisa. Not a script. But to me, it sounds like, listen, I, listen, I give it to her. Would I admit that I was drunk driving? Hell no. Right? For legal reasons, for liability reasons, and also just for guilt reasons, right? Yeah. If someone blasts me on national TV, I would deny it too. I'm not faulting her, but Monique, shut up. So then Candace said, <laughs> <laughs> so Candace said that, um, I believe that she was drunk and I believe that she fell asleep because she had too much to drink. Monique said, Ashley kept saying I had four martinis, but anytime I'm out drinking and driving, I limit myself. Candace said, then we went to Nima Colon. That's when she drank the whole bottle of Camus by herself. I don't know what Camus is. Maybe it's wine. And if you remember, Ashley was the one that bought it up there. Now, here's the thing. Robin says, Monique was totally fine with Ashley in the discussion about her drinking when she bought it, when she bought it up in Nima Colon. That night, we were in a hot tub all night chit-chatting and smoking cigars and having fun, I guess. But then we're back home, and here and here she comes to Karen's perfume event all pissed off. And I was looking at her like, "Why the, what the F is your problem? Why are you mad all of a sudden? Monique says, I actually didn't want to go to Karen's scent event because I was very hot with Ashley, but I wanted to celebrate my girl Karen. So I said to myself, I'm going to go and not say anything. This will be the quietest Monique they'll ever witness because I don't want to be pushed off the cliff. I don't want to go over the edge. I believe she felt that. And that's how it was until everyone started coming for me. Now, Robin said her anger, because you remember Robin laughed in her face several times. She said her anger to me was hilarious. And Monique was really mad. She would have said something in the moment, but she wasn't. She was just worried about the perception that the audience would have thought about her drinking and driving. That's why I was laughing. It was all performance. By the time we were on the street, I was really cracking up. Then Candace says, the next thing we knew, Monique was choking Robin out with the umbrella. Monique <laughs> said, if you guys don't know, Layla, you can set it up. That infamous scene where she put that, um, Monique put an umbrella to Robin's yes. neck. Ro Monique yes. seemed shook to me, though. What was your impression of that fight? You said she seemed what? Drunk to you? No, shook. Like, she seemed like, Monique oh. seemed like she was worried. What was your impression of that? If Robin was in your face, a woman like Robin, <laughs> would you not be worried? 
would you not be worried? Like, I'm not for weapons. Like, I'm not for <laughs> weapons. To be honestly, you could take your arm and put it up to somebody like that. Like, I'm I'm not I'm not for weapons. I don't like that Monique used her umbrella. I feel like yeah. she just yeah. should have used her body. But I can see why she was intimidated by Robin. Because, you know, Robin, being in your face, she's a large woman. I can understand that. Well, I can't understand know, that. I just don't like the weapon. I agree with you on that. And to your point, it wasn't until I saw binder times that I realized that Monique's legs are like, she's not, I never noticed because Monique's face, um, you know, she has like a, a, not a fuller face, but her, she's not, she's very thin down below. I never knew she was that thin, you know? So yeah, she's, yeah, she's a small girl. Yeah, she's, she's a small, small girl like Candace. Like she's taller yeah. than Candace, but they both have very slight frames. So yeah. um, you're right. But the thing is when she put that umbrella up to uh, Robin's face, you saw, I thought it was hilarious, even though I did not condone it, because you saw her mind go, you might be wondering how we got here. <laughs> and, she it, and she realized she was down the wrong road. You can see her <laughs> wrong road. Wrong road. But I hate people. I'm going to be honest. I'm not a big fan of Robin. And I hate people that take you to that point. Like Robin has a type of self-control where she can be aggressive, but she has her limits. She'll take you to that point, And then it looks like you're overreacting. Like when you put something up to block her, it looks like you're overreacting. But really, yeah. she's the one that is aggressive in that situation. And I don't sure. like that. I don't like that about Robin. I don't. Yeah, well, just, I don't like she did that to to Monique and to Ashley, and I didn't like either time when she did that. You know what? You are right about that. Ashley is not my favorite by far, but I do remember in the restaurant the way. And you're right; it wasn't a fair fight because Ashley is this big, and you're this yeah. big, and you know what's going to happen because who's trying to fight someone that's so much bigger than them? It's like nobody's trying to do a hell mary, <laughs> like literally. <Right. laughs> like, so, but here's the thing, right? So uh, Monique said, uh, I tried to walk away, but Robin and Giselle were instigating, arguing back at me and doing what they do, talking trash. I called them pinky in the brain. And then Robin got upset and got in my face. I was like, you better back up out my face before I hit you with this umbrella. Robin said, I wasn't worried she was going to do anything. I knew she was all talk. Monique Samuel said, Ashley later gave me an apology, a real one, but not until she went through something similar with Candace. Now this is where things get juicy, right? And we're going to hurry this up because me and Layla got something else to do, right? Yeah, we got another video coming. <laughs> but don't worry. We're going to post another book club. Hopefully, Layla can join. If not, y'all going to have me running my mouth, right? But we're going to dissect this book. For uh, for all of you guys that are wondering, I'm not reading blog posts. This is all diamonds or not roses or rosé or... Just it's just Google all diamonds are not rose or R O Z are not rose the Andy color. Yeah, rose. Yeah, yeah. It's rose. Okay, fine. Yeah. There we go. Cause I was like, what again, this title, they should have had Layla making the title. <laughs> now, um, Candace talks about briefly about the corona with Ashley saying that listen, Ashley told me she was trying to get uh pregnant but every time i looked you were throwing back a corona light to me that says you're not trying to get pregnant robin said um so then ashley said this interesting thing where she said say say anything you want about my relationship my marriage me my finances that's par for the course in my eyes but when candace started being so vocal and attacking my pregnancy journey that was a line for me so then robin says talking about finances was a line but ashley didn't mind that and then ashley does what ashley does she said but money is something a person will not have today and may not have tomorrow. Yes, Ashley, that's why people are so sensitive about money. Right. But losing, yeah, but losing a child and going through a miscarriage, I'm not going to get to get that baby back. That's a permanent loss I have to deal with. Don't make a mockery of that. I understand that. But do you remember Candace making a connection between Ashley, um, her unfortunate miscarriage and the corona? Do you remember Candace ever throwing that out there? Because Ashley yeah. swears the reason she got upset is because Candace tried to link her uh, unfortunate lose passing of her baby to okay. drinking the corona. Let me say this. Oh, so, so Candace Link trying to get pregnant, like that um, that journey of trying to get pregnant, she linked that to drinking coronas, which I don't necessarily agree with. A lot of people got pregnant tipsy, okay? <laughs> That's how you get pregnant, okay? But Candace made that link, like, okay, you say you want to get pregnant, but you're drinking coronas. And she was using, she was saying that based on what Ashley said. Ashley had said something about drinking, like Ashley was wearing socks. She was doing all these yeah. things saying that they would help your fertility. And so that's why Candace said that Candace was using Ashley's own words against her. But in reality, being tipsy or being drunk, it doesn't affect like your fertility. As far as I know, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like I was tipsy both times that I got pregnant. 
like yeah, I think it, it was a weird thing. Pregnant. Well, here's the thing. I, I feel like it was a weird thing where technically, if you're desperate to get pregnant, not drinking would help. However, to your point on a motherhood journey, if I'm trying to get pregnant and I decide to have a Corona one night, shut up, like mind your business. And I think it's that, yeah, that's her. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know what you're right. It might not have been helping, but it definitely wasn't hurting. And truth be told, I feel like Ashley is in the same situation as Portia. Instead of worrying about yourself, you need to be worrying about the 67 year old that you're laying in bed with. Maybe that's why there's a problem conceiving. I'm just saying. Like when I was looking at Ashley doing all these things, and I was like, or we could check Michael's count because I'm oh guessing. Yeah, not two of you, seven year old. <laughs> I'm guessing out of two of you, it was Michael's journey, fraternity right. journey, not necessarily Ashley's, right? Right. It's not the Corona. It's not the Corona. No, it's not the Corona <laughs> or anything. Ashley, you could wear all the socks you want, you know. <laughs> Get Michael off a grinder yeah, and let's get into this. this. <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. He's okay, scared. allegedly. Do y'all remember on the reunion where Karen busted out Michael for actually being on Grinder? And Michael was like, What are you talking about? Um, what did Michael say? What are you talking about? That's not even my profile. And I'm looking like that looks just like you, Michael. But you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll roll it back, right? Okay, yeah. so but here's the thing. This is what I'm getting to, right? And we might have to just continue this book club another time, but let's get into the- Yeah, because it's a lot. It's a lot to this. Yeah. Yes. So let's just get through this and then, you know, but okay. So okay. Um, we're, we, they, we cut to um, the feud between Ashley and Candace spilled over into Candace's house where the dinner party Candace's husband, Chris, was throwing, turned into one of the most jaw-dropping scenes in Potomac history. Now, Robin said, that whole party went left fast. We were supposed- and the, and. Keep an eye on this because Ashley is the queen of spin and deflection. They said we were supposed to be talking about the fact that Michael had said one night while we were out drinking. Yeah, I would. I would S one's D. I'm not saying in case little kids are watching. If you are, go ask your mommy if it's okay, right? <laughs> yes, go somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> he said that was the real elephant in the room we need to discuss. But Ashley immediately brought up the comments Candace made about her miscarriage. Candace said. We had been at Monique's Rabel baby shower and Ashley and Michael were once again putting on a whole performance. So I let them know, right? Um, Candace said, of course, Ashley had to tell me I'm in your mama's house because once again, it was all about painting me in this spoiled brat. But that set me off because I was like, B, your entire life is a dumpster fire and it's on display for everybody to see. So leave me and my privileged black American princess A alone, right? Monique said, Monique, always looking at Paul on. This is when I started to feel unsafe around Candace. Girl, you beat the charges. Stop. I believe her, though. I believe her, though. Oh, if really? you look at him, I do. I do believe her. Because if you look at how Monique acted toward Candace after that nice situation, her, her whole attitude towards Candace changed. And even though when they were at that dinner, she didn't really say much. She was sitting there pregnant. Her whole attitude changed. After she saw Candace toss that knife in the direction of Ashley, she was on defense mode every time she talked to Candace. And yeah. I feel like... When this whole situation with Candace and Monique happened, I was more on the side of Candace because I felt like Candace didn't attack anyone. Mm -hmm. But looking back, I do feel like Monique was in defense mode because she saw Candace throw a knife and she was like, it ain't going to be me. Like, you're not going to throw a knife at me. Like, it's, it's not going to be me. You know what, Layla? In the words of Robin Dixon, you almost had me. You almost <laughs> had me. Because listen, I almost had you. <laughs> you almost had. Because I was like, that makes sense. Except for the fact I forgot that, according to Cherise, Monique is Little Miss social climber, right? I don't think she felt unsafe. I think that she saw that Candace was on the outs with all the women. And she felt like if she was on an island with Candace, being Candace's friend, then by proxy, she was on the outs too. And I think in that argument, she looked and she decided, you know what? Let me be strategic. Because I know what you're saying about fault and safe. But after that, she had her in her house and she had her around her kids. And she was brushing yes, her around the hair. Her. I'm sitting there pregnant. I'm sitting there pregnant and you throw a knife. And I don't want to say she threw it at Ashley. She didn't throw it at Ashley, but she tossed it in her direction. So I'm sitting there pregnant and you tossing knives. And then you want to say that I don't, I don't have, a, I don't feel a way about that. I don't feel unsafe around you. Okay. Cool. But I would raise you. <laughs> and why are you pregnant? Talk about some, I'll drag you pregnant at all. What pregnant woman gets in a fight? Because let me tell you something. 
thank God I'm not close friends with anybody like that. But I've seen like on the public street, people arguing over the fry cook at IHOP and about to go to war when one girl's pregnant and one girl's not. And it's just like, oh my God, somebody call the police. Like the pre- some right, people don't right, care right, right. if you are pregnant. Most people have sense, but some people just don't care. So, I mean, I don't, but maybe she did. I'll, give you, that one. I'll give you that one. Okay, Tisa, I'll give you that one. Sure. I would never, as a pregnant woman, I would never tell somebody I'm going to drag you because there is a thing. When you tell somebody I'm going to drag you, you, you have to be prepared for whatever their response is. And their yeah. response might be to drag you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would never tell someone that. You got to be realistic. So I'll give you that one, Tisa. But I do think that Monique became defensive. Her attitude towards okay. Candace became defensive after she saw Candace toss a knife in Ashley's direction. Okay, I'll give you that. But then why do you think it was that Monique could become friends with Ashley when Ashley was the one that spread rumors all over about her being drunk, getting in a car accident, and even said maybe that's why you had a miscarriage because you were drinking? Right. And I've never, you know, I've never been in that situation where, you know, my child, my next child is a rainbow child. I've never been through that. But I do feel like women who have been through that can bond over Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. And so I felt like they, I felt like Ashley and Monique bonded because there's nothing like that. Like I couldn't even imagine that. And there's nothing like that. So I just put that as they formed a bond that other people don't understand. Even myself, I don't understand it because I've never been there. But when you say they formed a bond again, I'm just thinking about the timeline when Ashley was spreading those rumors, Ashley had already had her unfortunate situation and she knew that Monique, did she know that Monique had experienced that also? When she was spreading those rumors, when Monique was pregnant, I I I kind of remember her saying that it was a rainbow baby because her wasn't her baby shower a rainbow baby shower. No, I know that, but when uh, Ashley was spreading the rumors about her, do you think she knew back then? That's unclear because what you're saying makes sense unless Ashley was still spreading the rumors when she what knew that there was a rainbow, but maybe she didn't, right? But if Ashley is spreading the rumors, knowing that it's a rainbow baby, but then later she's in a situation like a, a, maybe a month or two later, she's in okay. a situation where her next baby is going to be a rainbow baby. You know what I'm saying? I just feel yeah. like it's something there where Ashley and Monique connected and it's something that people don't understand. Okay. Unless they've been in that situation. I will give you that. You know, we'll believe they both have nice Christian hearts. I'll give you that because (laughs) trauma, I'm about to say it, trauma, and especially when you lose a loved one, that really does kind of put life in focus. And you realize, like, this is stupid. And considering it's all for a show. So maybe that's what Candace didn't understand. They experienced something real outside the show that caused them to understand each other a little bit more. Okay. That's what I think. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, right? Um, So Candace is talking about throwing the knife. Monique says she feels unsafe. She said, that's when I started to feel unsafe around Candace. If she would wave a knife in somebody's face to the point where she could literally could have cut them. Layla, it was a butter knife. What is she talking about? It was a butter knife. Okay, this it is my was answer. a butter knife. Tisa, Tisa. Of course, it's sharper than a butter knife. <laughs> Layla, come on. Come on. Tisa. Okay, Tisa. My issue is the reason Mo, uh, Candace waved that butter knife is because her husband was sitting on her and wouldn't let her. <laughs> she, she wanted to throw Ash in the book. She said she wanted to throw Ashley's pocketbook um, out of the door because she was like, yes. she kept telling Ashley to leave. And Monique, uh, Candace, no, Giselle kept bringing, can't, uh, Giselle yeah, kept bringing Ashley back. And so she was like, if I throw her purse out the door, she'll leave. So she was saying all she really wanted to do was throw Ashley's purse out the door. But her husband was sitting on her and she felt like all she could do was just throw the knife, basically, I guess, to to scare Ashley. And so I always wonder, what if her husband hadn't sat on her? Like, how would that scene have gone? Would she have felt the need to throw a knife if her husband hadn't sat on her? You know what? Can we talk about that? Okay, let's talk about that. I do not believe that the scene would have escalated to the point of sheer frenzied anger that it did if Chris had not sat on her. I think by him sitting on her, again, I like Chris and Candace together. Nobody is perfect, but I do feel like he handles her like a child sometimes. And he doesn't realize that not only are you doing this, but you're humiliating me in front of these women. So Candace is looking at people smirking, feeling humiliated, feeling, and also 
you know how it is in grade school when fights happen. Usually the person that tries to break it up gets hit the most. So people get right. upset when you try to hold them back. I, I, I know Chris was trying to stop it. But I feel like he escalated to the point. And also, Candace is not a fighter. She's an arguer. And yeah. when someone's an arguer, when you try to shut them up or put their hands down, that's when they get really, really heated. So I think, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, a, it was a really embarrassing situation for Candace, partly because I feel like a lot of things with Candace, if Chris would just stand, and again, I like them together. No one's perfect. But I feel like if he could just understand that there's another different a game being played between the women, you yeah. know? And calling her mm -hmm. immature and a brat, I feel like that would help her a lot and help them a lot, you know? Yeah. What did you think yeah. about that? I feel like Candace and Chris, I feel like there's a certain, like, kind of like it's a, like a low level of DV between them. And it was being shown in front of these other women. Like you said, it's a whole nother, whole, it's like layers upon layers. You know what I mean? So yeah. you have Chris and Candace in their dynamic and showing their 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 physicality in front of other people like he's embarrassing her in front of other people he's making her powerless in front of other people and she feels like all she can do is just toss this knife she's not going to throw it at Ashley but she's going to toss it because she feels like at this point like she's physically being held back and this is all she can do yeah so I feel like that played a lot into that situation and now she has this this reputation of being a woman who is willing to wield a weapon yeah Shout out to Portia, being a woman that's willing to, to wield a weapon in an argument. And I feel like that's followed her throughout her her journey on reality TV. It has. And, yeah. It was her moment that just got stabbed in time. Yeah. And the thing I feel so bad for Candace is, I talk about this on my live all the time. There's such a thing as self-fulfilling prophecies, right? That's why they told um, parents, don't talk down to your children. That's why they tell teachers, say the kid's smart. Because- eventually when you keep telling somebody they are this they exhibit that behavior but at the very right. least it's incredibly defeatist as somebody saying Layla I know you're gonna mess up I know you're gonna mess up I know and five years later two years later one year later something happens and I'm like see same old Layla it's incredibly defeating to the human soul so like yeah. with Candace I kind of feel sorry for you have this narrative that you can't escape and nobody's letting you escape it Hence right. the thing Your husband is acting like you are the villain when you have these arguments with these women. And I, I believe we talked about this on um, our RHOP panel that when your husband is acting like you're the villain, when you're in these situations with these women, he doesn't have your back like Croy had had Kim's back. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? He's acting like you are the villain in these situations. It doesn't help. Like it makes things wor worse in your dynamic with these women. It does not help at all. Hey, Kathleen, thank you so much for yes, the super chat. <laughs> hey, Kathleen. <laughs> Shh, everyone, Kathleen's talking. What would you like to say, Kathleen? <laughs> but you know what? To your point, thank you so much, Kathleen. And to your point, um, I do remember Ashley's smirk when they were just at that table in the last episode, when Chris got up to leave all mad and that smirk Ashley had on her face and the way Candace wanted to go down, back, follow him, but she sat at the table for 10 more minutes because she didn't want to give Ashley the satisfaction. So I agree mm -hmm. with you. Chris needs to learn. Again, he doesn't under, and I don't want to put it down to something culturally because most people that I talk to understand, you need to stand beside me. We can argue in the car on the way home. You can right. give me the silent treatment, but just stand by me while it's happening, you know? So right. I definitely get that. All right, two more comments and then we're gonna finish up because we have held Layla here for so long. <laughs> we're gonna continue the book club. Uh, turn on your notifications because we are not even down this book. We haven't even gotten through the end of this part about it, but we are gonna see, right? Um, the one thing that stuck out to me where I said, Giselle is such an instigator. They asked her her opinion. Uh, Giselle said, and by the way, you're welcome for the better knife scene. Candace said, Giselle <laughs> likes to think she produced the whole damn thing. Giselle said, I pushed the story down the road. I want the truth and I know how to get it. And Ashley said, Giselle thinks she should be in the credits. To be honest, she gives herself a lot of credit for orchestrating things. And you know, to be fair, she does. And then Giselle said, in this case, when Ashley got thrown out, I knew I had to bring her back in because guess what? We're supposed to be talking about Michael and what he said about the PP and what he wanted to suck. That. And, and that had and that had not happened yet, right? So this is an amazing thing. It shows that Giselle is so so so. Um, oh my God, 
Oh, uh, yeah. Um, by the way, Dr. Payne Nestor, congratulations for being a Tattletale. Thank you so much for, for two month, your, your two month Tattletale anniversary. All you guys are interested in being Tattletale, it is $4.99. But listen, we wanted to wrap it up. The whole point is Giselle was to blame for everything that happened bad in Potomac. You saw this little green eyes cutting around the corner. So her eyebrows like, mm, right? You can blame for everything that happened. That's the point of all this book review, right? You, you know, it's the movie villain, which is Candace, and it's the real villain, which is Giselle, right? Yeah. Yes, and yes. And that's yes, why that. stays on her butt. Because Giselle started that mess with her too. All right, so Layla, oh, yeah, I always know. said that with that fight. If you look at who pushed, uh, if you look at who pushed Monique in that fight, it was Giselle. Giselle is impetus was, for all this. Yes, we blame was, and When Ashley had sense enough to get up and leave Candace's house, Giselle did have to go to the curb and talk her back in because even Ashley was like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Even she was like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it is her mama's house, you know, I just got kicked out. Yes. But you know what the funny thing with Candace is? She never goes below the belt with Michael because I would have walked into Ashley's house like, oh, look what Michael's money bought. You know, like I would have just. Has she no. been to Ashley's house? No, I don't think she ever got invited. Giselle did say in the book that one of the reasons that Ashley and Candace didn't get along is that yes. Candace was desperate to be. Ashley's BFF. Now, I don't know if that's uh, Giselle talking trash or being true because ne neither Ashley nor Candace made a comment about that. So I don't even know if they asked that question. Maybe they just look yeah. at that's Giselle's um, opinion and probably what she tells Ashley, her best. Oh, she's just jealous of you, you know? So, <laughs> Layla, you guys, <laughs> thank you so much for joining the first ever Tisa Tattletales book club. We got through most of chapter eight. We're going to be back next week. Hopefully, Layla will join. If not, it'll be by myself. <laughs> and I'll be doing, I'll, maybe I'll have some wigs out so I can really get into reading it, right? <laughs> we'll okay. do it up. I'll have like a little blonde. I was going to say, give you a bob. <laughs> I'm going to have a go naked headband wig for Giselle. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> so That's right, because Giselle is an ambassador. <laughs> exactly. And you guys, please give a warm welcome to Layla. Layla Lynn, if you guys don't know who she is, where have you been? She is YouTube royalty. She has paved the way for us. And we really, 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 um, we really, really appreciate you being on. You guys, make sure you follow Layla. She is on Insta, Layla Lynn. She is on Instagram and she is on YouTube. She does panels with the Grace Report. She does things by herself. She, it, listen, I've been watching her channel for years. I'm so happy that you're here. You guys need to go give her a follow. And also, you guys, if you guys want some more exclusive tea on What's going on? Well, Porsche is no thing. Real Housewives Tea. And also, don't forget my exclusive members only live is happening tomorrow night. Uh, we do it every other Friday. You guys, I know flight attendants from the United Arab Emirates. I know production assistants. I know models. I know actresses. I know actors, as it was. I know bartenders. I know everyone, whoever your fave is. You can inbox me before. I'm going to put a little agenda of what we're talking about. You can inbox me before just to see if you want to see a little bit more dirt. But this is a small world and people like to talk. The only thing is everything is confidential. It is $4.99 a month. You can cancel at any time. And it's a great way to support. So I can, you know, come up on here and talk some more trash more often. But in <laughs> our members only live, Layla, thank you so, so much for joining. You guys, make sure you follow you her. Oh my God, any time I love this. Hopefully we can have you back to the book club or some type of panel. We might be doing a panel, me, you, and Grace um, in the future. Yeah, I'll keep you guys posted on yeah. that. It's going to be good, okay? Yeah, y'all stay tuned for that. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. And I will post when the next book club is. We'll have it sometime next week. Don't worry. We'll have it. And let you guys, let me know in the comments how you like the book club, how you like the format. I mean... I'm not going to change anything, but I want to take the temperature of the room just to see how everyone's feeling, okay? <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Talk to you guys Thank later. You.